I'm going to talk briefly about the different um, types of ancient grains or the grains that are generally considered part of that group. Um, this project focuses on the wheat family, so einkorn, emmer, and bread wheat are all part of the same family. Uh, it's a very large and complex family, and so this is, quote, a simplified genealogy of the wheat family. Um, and I'm going to just focus on the grains that are being used primarily in the U.S. Um, and in Europe. So those, um, those fall into three different uh, ploidy levels, and I don't want to get into the technical details too much in the ploidy, but it's important to understand how these species are related. So um, diploid species are like humans. We have two sets of chromosomes, one from each parent. And then tetraploid species have four sets, and hexaploid species have six sets. Um, polyploid species can occur when there's a hybridization or a, a crossing between two species that have um, related but not identical genomes, and the offspring can keep both genomes, and then they have, um, rather than one genome, uh, two or three, and so they would go from being diploid to tetraploid to hexaploid. It's not important uh, when you're growing or baking with these, but it is interesting to see how uh, the wheat family has evolved over time. So the diploid species that are cultivated uh, is basically just einkorn. This, they're free threshing varieties, but very few of them. Most varieties are hulled, which means they have a gloom that adheres to the seed. And so they have to be dehulled before they're uh, used as food. And we'll talk some about that later in the webinar. Uh, the tetraploid species uh, include durum weed or rivet, which are the same species but have different agronomic and quality traits. Uh, emmer, which is also hulled like einkorn, and it needs to be dehulled before being used as food. And corazon, which is known in the States um, under the trademark uh, variety name Kamut. And then hexaploid is the most common, uh, our bread wheat or soft wheat, they, that's what most people think of when they think of wheat. Club wheat is a related species that's used primarily for pastry and grown in the Pacific Northwest. And then spelts, which is a hulled relative of bread wheat, um, and it also needs to be dehulled before being used as food. So. The domestication of this family started probably about 10,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent. And archaeological and genetic evidence point to somewhere in southern Turkey as the site of the initial domestication. There were wild wheat species growing in that area. And there are two related species that really form the muted of this domestication process. Triticum is the genus name for all of the wheat species. So there was a wild species of um, triticum that was domesticated to form einkorn. And the domestication process is probably, um, it probably is very gradual and may be spread out over the whole region. It's unclear whether it occurred in one site and then seeds were transmitted to other groups of people or whether the idea was formed in one site and then other groups may be domesticated very closely related populations of triticum monococcum in different regions of the Fertile Crescent. This is often thought of as the ancestor of wheat but actually it was a very closely related other species um, that was the basis of this part of the um, family, which is where the most common red wheat comes from and, and spelt as well. This Triticum R2 hybridized with an Agelop species, which is another grass family. This species is probably extinct, but related to a currently growing wild species. This formed wild emmer, which is tetraploid. You can see that this uh, AA means that's the representation of the of the genome that this species has. This species has AA. This is the B genome. They hybridized to form wild emmer, which is AABB. 
And the advantage of being a polyploid in an evolutionary sense is that generally it forms a bigger plant, um, bigger grains, and it may allow the species to be more adaptable because it has multiple copies of genes that can evolve based on environmental conditions. This species then was domesticated to form emmer uh, probably about 10,000 years ago. And from this uh, domesticated emmer, there was a fairly simple genetic change that made it free threshing, and that became durum or rivet wheat. Rivet is not a familiar uh, type of wheat anymore. Whoops, <laughs> sorry. Um, but it was grown in northern climates. It's similar to durum. It can be used for pasta, but it has better adaptation to cold and wetter climates and better freezing tolerance. It's the same species as durum, which is what we know as pasta wheat, and which is generally grown in more Mediterranean climates. Then to form bread wheat, which is hexaploid, uh, meaning it has six sets of chromosomes and three genomes, there is some controversy about what actually happened. Uh, the, the additional genome came from Agelops grotia. This is the same family, uh, same general family that, of grasses that uh, also has the bee genome in it. Um, and this probably hybridized with a free threshing durum wheat to form bread wheat. Uh, probably uh, it did not hybridize with a hulled wheat and then form bread wheat and then form spelt and then form bread wheat just because the genetic changes involved would have to be a lot more complicated to go that route. So the current evidence seems to point to um, bread wheat being formed first and then crossing with a domesticated emmer to form spelt, which is hulled. Again, this is an area of, of current research, so the whole domestication process is being understood better now that we have uh, more genetic tools to kind of look at what happened in, in terms of the genetics. But like I said, to, to grow or use these, you don't obviously have to understand the genetics. It's just interesting to know how these species are related to one another. Um, the different properties of these species also so is related to um, the, their ploidy level. So tetraploid wheats generally are good for pastas. Uh, durum has been used for pasta uh, the most extensively, but rivet wheat was also used up until fairly recently in more northern climates. It's since been replaced by durum wheat. Uh, in most countries um, where these species are native, the einkorn and um, durum wheats are used for flatbreads. And then the addition of the extra genome seems to have changed the gluten properties of uh, wheat and spelt to make them more um, able to form leavened breads. It's not universal because there are some einkorn species that can form good leavened breads, and some archaeological sites have shown leavened bread with einkorn grain. So while the general category is related to their end use quality, you can find varieties that have uh, good bread making quality in some of the diploid and tetraploid species. The interest in bread wheat as an ancient grain has often been in land races or in historic varieties. And so after these species formed, there was a whole process of adaptation to different local environments. And so different land races of each formed that were adapted to the location where they were being grown. And so we have land races of wheat, land races of emmer, land races of einkorn, and then historic varieties that have had some improvement by selection in the formal plant breeding sector, and then modern varieties that have had continued improvement, um, improvement in quotes uh, for more product, uh, higher yields, more productivity, but maybe not the same qualities as a land race or historic variety. So, in unmuted, this is, um, flatbreads are common. Probably all of these started as a 
cracked wheat bulgur um, pasta developed in the Mediterranean area. Frank is going to talk a little bit more about nutritional qualities of these different species and then June is going to talk about how they're being used now and the interest in different value-added products with the ancient grains. So with that, I will turn it over to Frank.